Hello, Michael, are you there? Michael. Oh my goodness, you're coming in through my phone. <laughs> this is, uh, hold up, man, I think you gotta hang up my call. Yep, there we go. So, uh, anyway, I am here to do the Remelia Black Ops speech. I am calling in with Michael Dragovic, one of my beloved coworkers, good friends. Uh, and we are going to be talking a little bit about the psyops that Remelia has engaged in over the uh, past, I don't know, two, three years? I don't know how long the uh, actual timeline is at this point, but I think all of this starts off with the history, basically, of Charlotte Fang as a person, right? So the Remelia CEO is a guy who, uh, he's sort of like an internet mercenary nomad guy. He goes around sort of... Uh, belligerently inserting himself into all of these online subcultures, learning everything that he can about, uh, you know, whatever their lore is, whatever they like to do, uh, taking any valuable piece of information, and then collecting all the best posters, all like the power posters, the people who basically have the ability to generate virality wherever they go, and brings them back into his little group, right? And this is how Romelia got formed, is he took all of the people who had any sort of a presence on the timeline uh, and he formed Remelia Collective out of a group chat called Hot Pot. Michael, Michael are you here? here? Is that what we heard? I see his, I see his vocal thing going off here, so I expect that he's going to be talking, but can't hear it anyway. Uh, so <laughs> we, uh, we get this band together of people in Hot Pot, and it's all kind of like, uh, you know, when I first joined, essentially, I was told, take the delete key off of your phone, right? So it was, it was this group chat where you're basically sending 15,000 messages a day, just power, uh, power iterating through like everything. You're learning as much about like uh, creativity, humor, whatever, by just sheer volume of iteration with everything that you're doing over and over again. And everybody in there sort of went from the people who they were when they like got brought in to like the best and most polished versions of uh, their, their creative selves, right? So when I got brought in, I was a guy I was poking around on like weird esoteric lifting Twitter. Uh, and then Charlie came in, and he was like, Lucas, man, like, you're, you're too good for this. What are you doing? Like, uh, why are you posting pictures of all these eggshells? Put your shirt on. Like, you're such a good boy. What are you doing, man? And uh, I do this, and I, I, I'm like, you know, you're so right, man. So I, I come in, and I start hanging out with him, and we... I, I can hear you. I, you're just really quiet, Mike. Okay, never mind. Uh, so... <laughs> we are all, uh, we're all in there, we're all sort of just going at stuff, tossing our, uh, tossing our generative abilities at projects, and uh, the first thing that sort of happened, I guess, was the Network Spirituality Show, and this was a creative pursuit where a bunch of the artists in there, they went out and they had a sort of a live web gallery that they did, and uh, this was like the first time when, you know, I, I had been kind of a stem cell prior to this. Uh, I didn't really have a good conception of art or what it was or what it was supposed to be. And this was the first time that I saw a bunch of people going out and producing something that was like, uh, oh, this is actually like cool. Like I actually liked the pictures that I saw, right? Like I was, I was very familiar with like sort of grotesque millennial art that gets produced, like uh, not, not to be, uh, not to name any names, but Beeple. Beeple's a great example of something that I wasn't a huge fan of. And uh, it sort of caused me to think like, you know, art is, uh, art is dead, right? Like, art is not something that I even need to be considered about. And uh, going and seeing all of this other stuff, I was like, oh, this is a whole gallery of things that I actually like and enjoy. And it made me realize, oh, maybe it's not, uh, maybe it's not actually dead. Maybe this is just a weird, a weird thing that I've fallen into. Uh, in, in terms of my like normal normal life and like what I've seen there, so uh, that was when I started seeing more and more about the ideology that uh, Romelia had inside internal the hot pot, and it was all like uh, it, it was basically about how art had been killed essentially by cancel culture, and art basically like anything that is pushing the boundaries, pushing any sort of artistic creative. Uh, limit is going to be inherently kicked out by cancel culture, right? Because like everything that was bounded was allowed. And if you break the bounds, you just get canceled. So Charlie was like, okay, well, in order to do actual art at this point, you kind of need to be canceled. You need to get canceled. You need to be willing to go on the chopping block. 
And that was a lot of the stuff that he started playing with. So after the, uh, after the I Long for Network Spirituality show, what we got into was uh, the Yayo Project, the first, the first token that Romelia ever released. And this was personally like... This was an insane this was an insane and really really fun thing for me because I had never been involved in copywriting before, right? Like I'd been a STEM guy. I had never done creative work. I'd like post it on the internet and stuff, but it was so fun to have a group of you know who I thought to be like essentially creative geniuses all focus this like laser like IQ at one singular goal, right? Like Yayo was a token that basically got formulized uh, it, it got it, it, it was, was, it was it synthesized, synthesized out of nothing, out of nothing over, over a few days, days of just, just like this, this frenetic haze, haze everyone working together, together everybody going, going out and out trying their best to like, uh, you, know, you know, like somebody would come out with a phrase like, cocaine, cocaine is biological, biological capitalism. capitalism. And then everyone would be like, holy shit. shit. Like that's, that's so, so, that's, that's so, so good, good, man. And like that, that one phrase would wind up filling out like an entire section of like a website. Like paragraphs of copy would be generated. I can hear you a little now. You said cocaine. You made me want to talk a little bit. I was going to say, man. Jesus, Jesus, here, here we, we go. go. How are we? How am I coming in? You're a You're little quieter than me. I'm, I'm definitely vocally, vocally dominating, dominating, dominating you right, right now. now. Yeah, well, I'm vocally dominating you on my side. Okay, okay well, well, this is... <laughs> I, can't I can't verify, verify that. that. It, it seems, seems a little, little bit dubious, dubious to me, to me but... but... Is it good enough to talk, or we gotta we got to still fool around and let you... Uh... Let you do a little bit of talking yourself? No, no dude, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm sweating, sweating up here, brother. Here, brother. <laughs> You're sweating? All right, well, yeah. if the audience can hear me. I, I, uh, do, you know I what like, do you know what it's like sitting here? Anticipating you coming in. in. You've, got You've got a bit of an echo, echo on, on your side. side. You've got to mute, mute your speakers. speakers. All right. So so beautiful. Beautiful. Can you all hear me? Is everything good? You want to hear about Yayo a little bit? I think they want to hear about Yayo, man. So... The Yale Corporation was my first foray into Romelia. I witnessed the I Long for Network spirituality show, uh, but as far as the actual corporation and what it entailed, Yale Corp was my first assignment. I came in on the Telegram to do community management, and what was special about that is that I was basically given free reign to kind of run it how I wanted. And what we wanted to implement was a sort of communication insurgency where people would essentially... Uh, each be an individual that you can imprint an idea upon. And we wanted each of them to be like a sleeper cell uh, uh, soldier. We wanted everybody to propagate Yayo, and we wanted it to carry on past our own existence. Like if we suddenly stopped, we would want Yayo soldiers to be continuing for years. Uh, like that one Japanese guy who fought World War II for 30 years in the Philippines. And, you know, it was somewhat successful. We had essentially created a very high energy uh, environment which was built around satirizing the shitcoin concept of 2021, where you would essentially have people that would, you know, join these telegrams and they would, uh, they would tell each other like, oh, I believe in this coin. This is really great. This is what I want. You know, this is uh, going to be the next Bitcoin. I'm going to use it to pay for my gas. And it's like Doge imitation coin number 637. They would be writing up white papers. They would be taking it very seriously. And it was all bullshit. It was people mutually bullshitting each other because they wanted to gamble on uh, basically just uh, high volume uh, liquidity uh, nonsense coins that were going to be disposable within two to three months. And you would go into these telegrams and they would spam rocket ship emojis and everybody would carry on with this mutual scammer mentality of uh, basically they go in and they think, oh, well, I don't really believe in this, but I'm going to say what I have to and pretend to be friends with everybody else. But they're all thinking that it was a mutual environment of extreme greed. Romelia saw that and we wanted to cut right through it like a Gordian knot. And we wanted to say, hey, these white papers that you're writing about shit coins, they don't fucking mean anything. These, uh, you know, these tokenomics, these primitives, they don't exist. You're just writing smart contracts and gambling like everybody else. And the only reason you're picking one Dogecoin out of another is because you like the aesthetic the best. And so we said, if that's the reason why people are making their decisions, what the name they like, what uh, you know, picture they like, what aesthetics they like, who has the best website, who has the best written white paper, why not just utilize the full force of a think tank and art collective and make the best looking one? And that was Yayo. So that's how we got our start there. And I think Lucas has uh, a little bit to say about that and how we kind of applied that uh, terror cell group chat concept into fully into Milady when we released it. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I, mean, I, I would also like to say that, that 
Yeah, yeah, itself, itself was hilarious, hilarious to me because, because I, never I never saw that. I, I never saw the direction that Scorch was given with anything, right? I just, I just saw him, him go into the group chat, into the Telegram, and start forming essentially uh, a, a, series a series of terror, terror cells. cells. Uh, and I was assuming, oh, like he must have been given some sort of instruction to do this, right? Uh, and then later, I eventually realized, oh no, he's just going. This is this was entirely, uh, you know, he just felt the vibe. And he was like, this is what I'm, I'm supposed to be building out here. So uh, that, that was sort of how everything at, at Yayo went and worked, right? Was it was just entirely, it was entirely based on what everyone felt was like the right vibe at the moment. And uh, then afterwards, like you were saying, it, it, that sort of terror cell vibe managed to get carried out much more effectively by Milady, not necessarily because of... Uh, I mean, there were, there were some, like, planning iterations and stuff like that, but it was basically because we realized that mimetic transfer works much better with an NFT than it does with a token, right? So you have, you have a picture of something, and that is much, much easier for people to form, like, a personal understanding, a personal relationship with. And Milady specifically was designed with the intent, basically, to... Like, all of Charlie's knowledge that he gained going through all these internet communities, figuring out everything about, like, avatar physiognomy, stuff like that. Like, oh, we're going to have... Uh, we're going to have the eyes positioned here. We're going to have, like, the, the neck at this point. Like, we're going to have it a right-facing avatar. We're going to make the eyebrows this way. Like, all of these things were intentionally designed to convey a specific type of energy to the poster, right? So you have the milady, and you, you wear it. And whenever somebody is wearing an avatar, they have the, uh, you know, you're basically posting as that person, and the social media site forces you to see it, right? This is something that people don't like think a lot, think about a lot, but like, there is an open feedback loop of, you have the open tweet dialogue thing on your phone, and then you have your avatar in the corner. And you realize that like, the post is coming from your avatar. Right? right, so, so there's, there's a, a sense, sense of, of like this is my personality, this is who I am, and when you change avatars, you're sort of putting on a new, a new skin, a new facade, and it does change your posting style, right? So by creating Milady, he sort of uh, was able to cultivate in everybody this sense of this is how you're going to be posting. Like I'm going to bring this energy out of you by giving you all this sort of similar, uh, the similar aesthetic thing that packages like a mimetic virus with everyone. And that was what resulted in everybody in Milady sort of, uh, coming out and posting in the, the similar way that they did, right? There was also obviously the fact that ideas were seeded by Hot Pod. They were seeded by Romelia. People would go out, like I had my Milady on. I went out on the timeline. All of us were picked specifically because Charlie liked our ability as posters, right? So we went out and he basically said, here are the, here are the network nodes within crypto Twitter. These are the people you need to follow. These are the people you need to interact with. Uh, go out and do what you do, right? Make things viral, make things fun. Uh, <laughs> stir up a little bit of trouble, and everything from there sort of, it sort of snowballed Scorch, what would you say? Pick things off, but I think it's important to remember we got our start through perseverance, not just boundless momentum. Crypto is sort of defined by these ADHD levels of, uh, you know, just fast momentum. The meta during uh, 2021 which, by the way, um, in terms of visuals, the NFT meta was absolute dog shit. You would have p like PNGs of like rocks and like, uh, you know, people putting out shitty Fiverr art and like the cheapest possible pixel monkey garbage. Milady legitimately was the first beautiful generative NFT. It was the one we put actual effort in. And we've always followed a philosophy of uh, if we wouldn't appreciate it, if it wasn't an NFT, we wouldn't sell it as an NFT. That's what Milady was about. You know, that's a profile picture that you would wear uh, with or without like the, the financialization behind it. And, you know, and that was the, the case, was, too. That was the case, because in the early days of Milady, we didn't mint out. People were wearing it specifically because they liked the profile picture. And that was sort of what curated it uniquely as a community. Right. There was like you have you have Bored Ape Yacht Club or something like that. If the shit wasn't worth like five million dollars, would anybody ever have that as their profile picture? Like, would anybody willingly put the picture of, like, the Fiverr monkey art on their avatar? Probably not. Uh, people... I could guarantee you on my life, I could hold a gun to every board Ape Yacht uh, holder's <laughs> head and put them on a polygraph and ask them, would you, would you have appreciated this if it wasn't worth a couple thousand dollars? And nobody would pass that test. They would all be gone. They would be wiped from this <laughs> earth. The, the Milady, um, Milady didn't sell out for six months, and it sort of established the Remelia bucket pattern. Uh, we did it for uh, Romilio. It happened with Yayo NFT, where essentially, if you don't sell out in five minutes, you're supposed to give up, right? 
you're supposed to go away. You know, you're supposed to just change your name and start a new project and do another pump and dump. But we held on for six months and we proved our uh, community and we fermented our culture into something that's actually viable. That's what gave it value too, because an NFT is supposed to be a tribal signifier where, uh, we're literally saying like, Hey, this is the tribe you belong to. And the tribe that we turned Milady into is the one that people wanted to be in. So that's what gave it value. But I think the bucket pattern is always going to happen. I don't think we've reached a point where we could put out anything and people will just say, Oh, I want that. I'm, and it sells out in five minutes. Well, the bucket I think pattern, every project we, the bucket pattern happens project, by virtue of us basically pushing new frontiers, right? So the thing that happened with Milady was not that, uh, you know, like Milady didn't get better after six months. It didn't suddenly gain value, right? It was always the same thing, but it was just crypto Twitter basically being on a half year lag, figuring out, oh, like, this is good, right? Like it had to take, there was a lot of posting that had to come through for them to s start getting it, right? An example of this was like, uh, there was the way, the way that Milady started like reminting out again was this, this influencer named Bulma. Uh, and I, I was going around basically trying to mess with a lot of the crypto people. One of the things that I did with her was I sent her a DM where I, I faked a screenshot of her pretending that she was going to kill me, uh, pretending that she was going to like cut my head off in some like exorbitant way. And I was like, oh my God, like, are you really planning to kill me, Bulma? Like, is this true? And, uh, she didn't respond. And then I had my secretary every like uh, 30 or 45 minutes hit me up throughout the workday over the next three days or so. So I have this series of like 40 messages. It looks like I'm just nonstop thinking about Bulma murdering me, right? Like I'm, I'm horribly worried about this thing. And uh, I started asking stuff like, Bulma, like if, if this is true, like if you're really going to kill me, could you give me like, could you give me a heads up so that if I know if I only have three weeks left to live, I'd like to take PTO. Like I don't want to spend my last uh, three weeks alive in the wage cage. Uh, she didn't respond, absolutely heartless. And then I finally f uh, finished off with like another screenshot of her saying like, I am going to kill him on March 27th. Like if he thinks, if, if he thinks that this isn't going to happen, he's a delusional retard. And I was like, Bulma, this is extremely disheartening. So then I go and I start following her around on the timeline saying like, hey, Bulma, like, could you check your DMs? Uh, she didn't respond for like 10, 15 of them or so. And then eventually she was like, oh my God, like you're a deranged freak. Like, you're, you're an insane person, man. So she takes, uh, she, she takes the whole conversation and posts it. And uh, all of crypto Twitter starts like, oh, my God, this guy's a deranged freak. Like, he's evil. Everybody block and report. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> but it was probably like 80 to 90% of people on crypto Twitter who didn't get it at all. Like, one third of my mutuals probably had me blocked at that point. Uh, I got a lot of I got a lot of not very nice uh, DMs from people. There was definitely some uh, hatred and vitriol going on. But then I played it out in the comments, right? And I, I basically LARPed it off as, "Oh yeah, I am genuinely afraid that this person is going to kill me." And it was like, you know, she's she's some like uh, nice posting like vegan woman, right? Like she would never kill anyone. It was obviously like an insane thing. And the reason that we didn't like I was thinking about actually putting the screenshots up on this screen, and we decided not to because. They're so, they're so not subtle that if I showed them all to you right now, you would think they're not funny. Like you'd be like, oh, this is like, this is so obvious of a joke that it's like stupid and bad now. But that's just a testament to the fact that like, that's how far the Overton window has shifted within this sphere. Like three years ago, stuff like that didn't pass as like an obvious joke. It was like, oh, this might actually be an insane person. And that's largely due to like Milady posting overall as a theme, as a concept of just dragging the Overton window, forcing everything to sort of be uh, normalized within this, right? In the same way that like the Yayo shitcoin concept, like, oh, we're just going to accept that this is like, this is an aesthetic project. People are buying this for the meme of it. People are buying this because they think that it's fun and they like the way that it looks. That's something that like, that's common now. That's every shitcoin. Every shitcoin has now become an attempt to recreate Yayo, but like they're three years later, right? Go for it, Scorched. Audi too, kind of came from like biz culture, like the 4chan biz board. Uh, that's where a lot of like, that's where wag me comes from. That's where the pay pay memes come from. Um, you, you, crypto kind of has a lag between that sort of thing. They're just now rediscovering the red laser eyes. That was like a 2019 Twitter core, but they really lost a lot of that edginess and that actual internet culture feeling. Uh, especially when more retail marketing came in, you, you look at the timeline now, it's complete shit posting. Everybody pretty much acknowledges, it, acknowledges it's pure gambling. Uh, Romelia kind of had to reintroduce that edginess a little bit. And of course, uh, in art, you're supposed to push the boundaries of, uh, of the medium that you're in and the topics that you handle. Uh, 
and you know you get slapped for it sometimes and i think this kind of led into what the cancel was for us where people you know they were kind of afraid of what we had to say they were kind of uncomfortable with the irony and they were uncomfortable with the satire and they're also i think financially motivated to try to take the competition out and uh that's kind of how the cancel precipitated it was a small number of individuals who were financially motivated to basically uh push remelia out of the market because they couldn't compete fairly and they all admitted this, by the way. We actually got them to apologize publicly, and we have like them like publicly admitting every single thing they did was uh, complete horseshit. But it, for a while, it was uh, it was pretty rough, you know. We it was uh, it, people don't understand that cancels aren't actually about exchanging information, and it, it's not like a court of law where you're trying to seek out the truth and due process. It's a hundred percent psychic warfare. It's about gathering as many people as you can to send negative energy onto an individual and get them to give up, get them to go away, get them to fuck off. And we uh, we obviously didn't, and very few people actually do tank a cancel of that capacity. And what I think is interesting too is that very, very few people are in the position to actually study the psychology of a cancel and how it affects you on a physical, psychic, and spiritual level. And it's something that I noticed in myself when we were dealing with the cancel. It was like a pretty rough time. Um, it, uh, I, I don't know how Lucas coped, but I, I always got like very curious about it, like a doctor performing surgery on himself. I was like, huh, this feels weird. I've never felt like this before. I literally have like thousands of people, you know, sending negative energy my way and like in my close friends uh, direction as well. You know, and maybe it was a little rough for me and Lucas. Maybe it was a lot more rough for some of the people that aren't as uh, social media like experience because you know immunize when, when she, the stuff. Immunize. But, you know, it was roughest on Charlie because he was receiving the most hate. Uh, and I think it's. I think it's super important that we didn't go away because that is what precipitated leading to our post cancel status where we're now immune. It's like a one-time deal. You try, you try your, your biggest best weapon. And then if it doesn't work, you're fucked. Godzilla just keeps coming. Um, Lucas, you know, I could talk a little bit about, you know, psychic warfare and how it affects me, but how about you yeah. uh, start by how you dealt with it? But no, I mean, definitely Scorch and I were funny with this, right? Because hot pot was basically being assaulted from uh, the outside by like an unironic, like spirit bomb with all of this stuff. Right. So he, like, like Scorch said, it is psychic warfare in the sense that, you know, when you have thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people wishing you ill will, there is literally like a psychic a psychic uh, like battle ram that is getting whacked against you. You can log off, you can leave your computer, but like there's like a physical sense that something like someone is like screaming psychically into like the ether, and it's like coming and like berating you, right? So there, there's a. Uh there's definitely a negative energy that's being sent to you and everyone has their own way of dealing with it. Scorched was funny because he went in and basically started noticing like, oh my God, like I'm physically dehydrated. And he, he figured out one day like, oh, I haven't been drinking. Uh, I, he had a drink and he's like, guys, like you're actually not as fucked up as you think you are. You're just dehydrated. So he goes into the group chat and tells everyone, go drink some water, stay hydrated. And that's how they started getting uh, back into the play. I basically just said, oh, these guys want me to feel sad. I should just post normally. Right? Like I basically just said, I'm just going to ignore it. That was my, uh, my mental cope with it. And then by the end, I did a little tap dance on the timeline said, like, if, I, I guess it was kind of funny that Miladies just like, uh, posted their way through the uh, biggest cancel in CT history. And uh, that was basically the only acknowledgement that I ever gave it, really. Yeah, you know, I, I was, was in, in uh, spaces for three days straight, 12 hours a day, just arguing with people that hated my guts, you know, screaming at six people at a time. Um, you know, this is kind of where the PSYOPs comes in, too. Uh, we, had, we had been participating in this sort of half-truth, half-fiction KFOB on the timeline long before this. This is something that Charles and his prior communities, they were very adept in. We had uh, obviously gone through several cancels already through his different personas as Mia and Sonia. Um, but we had also had this air of mystery to us where people weren't sure what was real and what wasn't. We had fabricated cancels on ourselves before. We had performatively, uh, you know, enabled them. And this was real. And a lot of people weren't even sure if it was just another shit post. Um, but people 100% wanted us dead. It wasn't our doing. And 
I think uh, I think it's important to mention too that it's not just us doing psyoping. This is a mutual thing everybody sort of participates in. Uh, in the spaces, for example, one person in particular, I'm not going to name names here, but <laughs> a very big CT influencer basically paid like three women that were like in their mid 40s and they sounded like like the white trash lady that is on meth and screaming at the cashier at the bus station. Uh, they basically paid them to put on miladies. And say like, well, I've been a part of the Milady community for months, and I think Rebelia just needs to get out, and the community just needs to run itself. People that nobody had ever heard of before or cared about, people that weren't part of our community, they were sending in like George Soros tier astroturfers to push this narrative that you know. I, I would I say was it was substantially in. lower than George Soros tier astroturfers, but uh, you you can uh, well, define it as you want. Well, they were trying to push this very common narrative that happens to other projects, too. This happens all the time. People will create something. Outsiders come in, and they find some way to declare that this guy's toxic. We need him out, and the community needs to run itself. It's that decentralized meme. Turn it into a DAO. Let the community go where it wants to. And that's just fundamentally you know, not, not capable for a small startup uh, you know, community until it becomes a viral egregore on its own. Well, specifically, and they, for, they do specifically so for Romelia, right? Because so much of what Milady was and as it has been defined was like, you know, it, it didn't just like fall into itself, right? Like the image itself was curated to give off like the type of energy that Charlie wanted, but like it wasn't specifically from the image. Like Milady posting came from us. It came from Romelia, right? Like M Romelia members were platformed as, you know, the Milady posters, so when, when you wanted to like seed the idea of what is Milady posting, like that came from Romelia. It wasn't just like this organic thing that appeared out of nowhere, right? Like that was in itself like a psyop. It was, it was like a marketing operation. So the idea that you're going to say, oh, we're going to wrap Miladies. We're going we're gonna to make them open to the community. It's like, okay, well then who curates it, right? Who, because the person who's been curating it is now removed from the picture. Do we think that it's going to r remain the same community? Or do we think that something uh, like every other NFT community that exists is going to happen, right? Grown larger since, I think the cancel was also, um, it, it's funny that it actually, we were in Portugal when the cancel happened, so it's a nice little coincidence that we're coming back. Um, it, they were basically in like, in like a bunker uh, mansion, uh, you know, all just kind of watching it unfold. And within that travel period where they were going through different Airbnbs across Europe and kind of remote working on projects, the cancel pre precipitated what would eventually become Romelio Redacted Babies. Um, <laughs> the Redacted stands for retarded, by the way. Uh, Romelio was 100% us declaring we are now post-cancel. Like, we're, we're immune to your identity politics bullshit. We're immune to disingenuous narratives. And it 100% played with cancelable topics. It was sort of a sat satirization of the QAnon schizo tier posting mixed with a sort of playful boyish target t-shirt, middle schooler, uh, smoking smarties type, uh, type aesthetic. And uh, that's kind of how Romelio uh, came into play. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about Romelio before we get into the, the false flag war that we seeded? I thought we were just going to jump into the false flag for, but yeah, no, Romelio was, Romelio was technically my favorite, uh, Malay, or my, my favorite, uh, Romelia NFT collection, I think, because of, uh, you know, the hyper citationalism of it, like every single asset within the Romelia collection, Romelio collection has a, uh, it's, it's a reference to some other thing, like some other piece of lore, right? Like there's a hair trait that's named after me. There's hair traits that are named after actually like a lot of the Romelia members. Uh, there will be like a, an article of clothes that's named after like some sort of silly, like, like the Bulma event, right? By the way, I should add that Bulma woman, uh, the one who I pretended I was afraid was going to kill me. Uh, we're, we're great friends now. She's, she's totally good. We don't, we, we don't need to disparage her. But uh, so there's like references to stuff like that, like basic pieces of Milady lore that just get tossed in throughout all of the Romelio traits. And uh, I, I, like, I like it a lot more. Like I know I wound up being like Milady guy, but like honestly, I kind of like the pointy edges, right? Like I am like a 12 year old boy at heart in the sense that like, I like the silly like South Park graphics, the uh, like silly vulgar jokes. Uh, Milady was like, it's very sweet and stuff, but uh, that's naturally how I align. Uh, and what, Scorch, did you want to say something before we get into the, uh, the Civil War? No, I want to get into it. So we 100% um, 
this was supposed to be a very silly small thing that we were going to do. It was just, what, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be funny if we made our community play dodgeball with each other, basically? So the way we decided to execute that was to create a completely false narrative that Remelio was just a random derivative that was a cheap dollar store ripoff of Remelia Corporation. Even the name was like, you go to the dollar store and you buy a G.I. Jim action figure. Um, and Lucas was you know, told to switch to that profile. And for a while, people hadn't understood that it was actually Remelia that released the project. We were very unclear about it, and we purposefully didn't announce it normally. Uh, in the Discord specifically, um, the Milady Terracell element is that each chat, by the way, is its own community. So every single person in every medium that discusses Milady believes that they are 100% the singular Milady community, and there's sort of uh, there, there's a little cross pollination between them, but they're all slightly separated from one another. And that's done on purpose. We want everybody to sort of be self-sufficient. So if one goes down, the other still survives like a <laughs> hydra. Um, in Discord particularly, you know, we carried out the war on the timeline. And I think that was more your territory. But yeah, what we yeah, had no, done... So, so I... Uh, go, go ahead. Okay. So the Milady Romelio Civil War was... Because really, this was how we launched it, right? So we never, we never told everyone, like, oh, this is like our new collection that we were launching. Partially because we wanted to have some fun with it, but also partially because we wanted to flex on everyone. We wanted to say, okay, we did it once with Milady. We can do it again now without our own reputation. Like, we can still do the same shit. We can still build the community. We can still create the same cult without even saying, oh, this is Romelia. And the plan basically was going to be that we were going to come out and, uh, you know, it is just a derivative. And I, I said that I, oh, I, I'm defecting from Charlie. Like I've had, I had like creative differences. He's evil. I'm not going to be friends with him anymore. Uh, so I'm endorsing this other project. And I made like a, a custom Romelio that, uh, it was basically my Milady, but with like a bunch of blood splattered on it, and it had like a halo over it. It was in heaven. It was basically like I've killed my Milady, like I've killed my past self, and I've come out now and uh, become this new Romilio. And I just started posting a bunch of like super silly, like uh, like totally Valence critiques of Charlie that uh, they didn't really mean anything. And he would like respond, being like, "No, Lucas, like how could you do this to me?" And it was. Uh, I thought it was I thought it was going to be overly obvious, but it wound up like giving everybody actual like brain damage and trauma, right? Like all of my friends who had been very involved in the Milady community, they were messaging me like, "Lucas, like, how could you do this? Like, what what did what did Charlie do wrong that deserves anything like this? This is fucking horrible." And uh, then they start fighting, right? Because some some joined me, and some there were other like Romilios, so people would defect and join me. Maybe they liked me more than Charlie, and then there were other people who remained with Charlie, and then people started fighting, and. We, we planned to do this for about a week and then we had to cut it after like 18 hours because we were killing like actual, like we were seeing like marriages being blown up, like lifetime friends abandoning each other. Like all of these people were actually like at each other's teeth and it's still to this day is something that annoys us. Like we, we went too hard accidentally. Uh, because we we're, we want the whole like Romelia ecosystem obviously to be friends with each other, right? We want everybody to be like a whole holistic community. And now we accidentally did this thing where we drove like a massive wedge between everybody, and they're constantly trying to kill each other now. Still, like there's weird battle tensions from uh, this traumatic incident that we created on the timeline as like a marketing gimmick. Yeah, we 100% accidentally balkanized the community a little bit. Um, you know, in the Discord specifically, what we had done was create a separate label color for Romilios, uh, so that it was sort of a Stanford prison experiment. We assigned a few to people randomly, and there were chats about strategizing this meme war between the two sides. I was in both chats, and I was kind of uh, giving advice to both lieutenants who were running each division. Um, you know, I would produce memes uh, that would make fun of each other, basically just cheap regurgitations of like Giga Chad versus Virgin, uh, Wojak versus Pepe memes translated into Romilio versus Milady. And I was giving instructions and I was also doing balancing. So if one side was starting to win too much, I helped the other side more. And we perpetuated tension to the point that uh, I, I feel like a lot of people were smart enough to pick up that it was... Uh, you know, it was basically just like play. It was like pro wrestling. It was kayfob, but kind of like how pro wrestlers will get into a performance so much that it becomes reality. And sometimes they'll actually fight each other and break kayfob. It was sort of uh, seeming to happen. People were starting to actually pick sides and attack each other, like our little Stanford prison experiment gone wrong. Uh, and like Lucas said, it still perpetuates to this day. Um, 
it's not not as extreme. We've took we've took actions to kind of uh, neutralize it a little bit and get people to get along. But <laughs> Romilios will still duke it out with Miladies on the timeline, and this extends actually into the singular projects where Romilios will fight each other. They'll have asset wars where someone uh, Nikobs versus Onis versus Nuns. That kind of happens with a lot of our projects now, where people pick some pick a Grail and then they they pick teams. It's a natural human tendency to tribalize, and I think it's only going to get more extreme the more we release and the more uh, our community grows. But yeah, it definitely got a little carried away there, that's for sure. You know, these kind of uh, psyops kind of extend into our other projects as well. I want to talk about Beetle Game a little bit. Uh, you want me to get into that, or do you have any perspective on how you got familiar with Beetle Game first, Lucas? I think you should run through Beetle Game. We got about seven minutes left, by the way project uh i took a nap i took a fucking nap in an afternoon like for three hours you know normal work day nothing's going on all of our projects running on maintenance no news no new developments i go to sleep and i wake up and the chat is going fucking crazy it's like people screaming beetle game in all caps and the, like charles is yelling like do this do that like make these assets code this like and he's typing out long thesis about what beetle game is going to be and i was like what the fuck is this and they're like scorch this is a project we're going to launch tomorrow <laughs> and i'm like what the fuck this wasn't a thing when i fell asleep um we basically did a, a messed up all night hackathon type uh just constant push to like get this out in 24 hours uh it wasn't what we wanted it to be by the next day it was sort of um it was sort of like a rabid uh lucidity after we calmed down and we're like holy shit what were we doing um <laughs> you know we it wasn't good enough the tokenomics weren't where we needed it to be we didn't have enough art uh it, we were gonna shelf it for a while it almost became a pain point to us where we were basically like okay well we'll uh, we'll look at this later we'll we'll approach it later and th but the community picked up on it and everybody went ape shit. They were like, oh, Beetle Game, Beetle Game, when's Beetle Game coming out? I think Beetle itself, the symbolism gets people like amped up. They become like insects, they, they get haywired. Um, so we used that when we wanted to market Banners. Banners was a quick in-between project while we were working towards releasing things like Yale NFT and Bonkler. Uh, for Bonkler like, specifically, because it began with a B, and because we were releasing a project called Banners, we were like, okay, why don't we tease the community a little bit and Charlotte would post like a thing saying uh, he would just post the letter B and then he would encourage people like we had to seed like the ladders on uh, Twitter. Like, you know how they make an N ladder that you get banned for. So we were making like B ladders. So one person would reply, O, and then people would spell out Bonkler. And then uh, another per person would post E and then they would spell out like Beetle Game. And for a while, everybody was like, oh, my God, Bonkler's coming out. Oh, my God, Beetle Game's coming out. Beetle, Bonkler, Beetle, Bonkler. And then, you know, we would announce, hey, guys, uh, the long awaited Banners project you've all been hearing about finally comes out. And everybody was super pissed at us. They were fucking <laughs> furious. <laughs> so. We, uh, it, it, you know, became a tease for a while. Beetle Game almost was sort of mythologized into the magnum opus that would never be, like Stanley Kubrick's Napoleon uh, movie. But, uh, you know, I, I guess I wanted to take the time uh, during the PsyOps talk uh, to say that Beetle Game is definitely coming out very soon. So I uh, just wanted to mention that. Development has been and, ramped up on Beetle Game. This isn't a PsyOps. Yeah, it's, it, it's not a PsyOp. It's actually coming out very soon. Um, but, I think I think yeah, speaking we, speaking of psyops here, I think we could sort of uh, seg into the uh, the bit about psyops themselves being art, psyops being the ultimate form of communication, psyops being like the the top to bottom of it all, right? So we have uh, Romilia is a group chat, and there were a lot of comments early on, like, okay, your your thing is formed out of a Twitter group chat, like that's a little silly, but. What you realize eventually, if you hang around stuff long enough, is that everything is a group chat, top to bottom, right? George Soros has a group chat. I guarantee you George Soros has a group chat that he carries out all of his international politics through, right? And everything winds up just being a collection, a think tank of people who wind up doing the same things that we did, where they, they just brainstorm, they bounce ideas off each other, and they try to come up with... Uh, you know, they want to influence public perception, and the ways that you influence public perception are by saying, okay, we want people to think this, they currently think this, this is the surrounding context, and you have enough creativity that you basically connect the wires, right? So it winds up all being sort of an art project in that you have to creatively be able to figure out what buttons you're going to push, what levers you can use to get people to think what you want them to, right? It's all, 
it's all, and it's, this isn't like something that's, again, not unique to Amelia. This is something that like every marketing department does this, every government does this. Uh, teenage girls do this also. And it, it all happens at varying degrees of efficacy, right? Like there's definitely, there's definitely a group, a teenage girl group chat somewhere out there that's winning, beating out all of the other teenage girls, crushing them in terms of the drama spread in their high school. And one day they're going to grow up and they're going to be brilliant marketers, right? They're going to be brilliant artists. And, uh, Scorch, what do, you, what do you have to say about the, uh, the group chat origins of all this? You know, that's the dynamic we were always trying to say, that like uh, a bunch of like gossiping like people at a cafeteria table is no different from the CIA uh, basically spending thousands of dollars to disseminate information and control narratives. It's a very natural human thing. Ever since la the, the parasite of language was invented and forced us uh, to communicate in that manner, um, it's always been about framing and narrative and perspective. In a way, psyops is something every single person does every single day. You look at yourself in the mirror and you have an idea of yourself that you want to perpetuate. Other people have a different idea of you, and they are they all carry on with these different frames of reality. Uh, you know, before Edward Bernays kind of pushed marketing as the big thing, uh, the natural state of a corporation was that if somebody goes to a major corporation in the United States and says, "What's going on internally? Why are you guys doing this?" the socially accepted response was mind your fucking business and after that after public relations got invented that was no longer an option that you have to have transparency you have to have a pr guy you have to start participating in psychic warfare because if you don't the other guy will and you'll get beaten out it's just pure game theory psyops is important to art psyops is a form of art and art is implicitly psyops because an artist has to take something that's produced out of pure instinct, a natural inclination based off of feeling to invoke feelings in other people. And I feel like most artists don't fully have a top-down, step-by-step uh, process. They don't, they don't, they don't understand that art is the context, right? Like, Milady is art, but like Milady wound up being what it is because of the context surrounding it, right? If it wasn't for what the people who wore the Milady did, it never would have been it never would have been what it is today, right? So everything has to be looked at in terms of the context of it all. And art isn't created in isolation anymore. Net art is a thing because what is, what is the net? The net is everybody connected online, which is inherently like a collective thing. There's now a, uh, you, you basically cannot create anything involving a culture or context with any degree of isolation. It has to be sort of painting on the social fabric. Anything that comes out now, any sort of new art is going to be making a cultural statement broadly about uh, the, the net. Effectively, that's where we all live now, and uh, we've we've got about thirty seconds here left, so I think we should probably wrap up. But uh, what I wanted to say basically is this concludes the start and end of the Romelia Black Ops division. This was uh, our final psyop. We're going to be closing down. Uh, it will never happen again. And our our final act, right, is going to be distributing some merch. If you guys want to uh, grab some hats or stickers after this. Yeah, keep an eye out for Milady Fumo coming out soon. And uh, yeah, we're, we're never going to PSYOP again. You know, we told you all our secrets. Everything we'll say is above board. We will never do another PSYOP forever now. The, it's over. Black Ops is done. And frankly, the Black Ops division never existed in the first place. Don't Good worry luck. about it. Good luck and Godspeed.